first of all, welcome and good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for coming today. Uh, I first want to acknowledge the traditional custodians um, of the land on which we are, are here gathered today, the Wuhu, Kaba, and the Bindal peoples. Um, and I'm also just so honored to be able to welcome not only an amazing colleague and scientist, but also a really, really good friend of mine to, to give our seminar today. It's really exciting. He's done here. Stand here. They can see you in front of them. Oh, no. I don't know if they want to see me. They're here to see her. <laughs> so it, yeah, it's absolutely my honor to, to welcome <laughs> Professor Gudrun de Book. So Gudrun, um, as I mentioned, has been a friend of mine for ages, I think probably about 17 years now or so, you know, since we were very, very young. Um, but Gudrun studied in Belgium and did her PhD at the University of Antwerp, which is actually where she is now, she's based now. But she also did a postdoc in Canada, which is actually, I think, where I was first interacting with Gudrun and learning about her research. She was at McMaster University with Professor Chris Wood, who is another sort of father of fish physiology. Um, and during that time, she was doing lots of work out at Banfield Marine Station with some of the sharks out there, which I think she might mention a little bit in her seminar today. And so, yeah, I've actually followed Gudrun's work for a really, really long time. Um, at the University of Antwerp, where Gudrun is based, she's the um, program leader for Ecosphere, which is a fundamental and applied ecophysiology and toxicology research group. Uh, not only is she a mentor and a role model to me and to many others, but we also co-supervise a former master's student who's kept on to do a PhD with us as well. And I'd also like to point out that during all this COVID, uh, madness. Gudrun was still able to travel um, being European and so she was out with her partner at our field site in French Polynesia this last season and was mentoring my team out there and just did a really spectacular job and I was so grateful that we were able to keep things going even though we couldn't travel here um, with COVID. So lots of reasons to just think um, I'm really grateful for Gudrun to be able to come and give our talk today. So without further ado, please, Gudrun. Well, thank you very much for this very kind introduction. I'm almost speechless. <laughs> um, and thank you for inviting me for this seminar series. And I'm um, going to talk to you today about uh, elasma brines and more specific the work I've done uh, with sharks and um, how their physiology uh, kind of differs from marine telios and how this affects their responses to their environment. So does being different uh, pay off? Um, well, it seems to pay off if you look at this. Um, sharks have been around for a really long time. Um, they found fossils that they back at least 450 million years ago. Um, they were there before the dinosaurs, even before flowering plants. So it seems like the way they are is actually quite good and they can survive quite a bit of uh, events. Where is the little thing there? Oh, there you go. Um, so we talk about uh, from Richtius, uh, and this is of course because their um, skeleton is made of cartilage, so anatomically they're already quite different from uh, other marine fish. Um, and when we look at Elasmobranchi, which do not include the chimerae, uh, the group that we will be talking uh, about today are these Elasma uh, Then, yeah, their name comes from the plate like or lamina like um, gill structure uh, they have. And we will be talking a lot about gills as well. It's not because they're a very ancient group that they're also considered a very primitive group, because it doesn't mean that you don't. It's not because you exist long that you haven't evolved uh, in the main meantime. And um, so their physiology is actually not more primitive than any other um, fish. Maybe I'll just do this. Oh, 
yeah, of the five pushes. Um, so um, they do differ from marine telios. Uh, and one of the things that differ is that we don't really know very well how to measure stress in a shark. Their um, main stress hormone is believed to be uh, one alpha hydroxycorticosterone, so not cortisol as uh, in you and me, uh, and in marine fish. Um, and it's not so easy to measure. And one of the reasons is that it's not very easy to synthesize, so you have no standard. So that makes it uh, quite hard to uh, measure it. Also, their metabolism uh, differs. Uh, when uh, we do an, an intensive exercise, you will, of course, um, first look at carbohydrate metabolism, use glucose. If it's aerobic, it uh, gets completely uh, used up. If not, if it's anaerobic, you'll produce lactate, uh, which then later on could be reconverted back uh, to glucose. So, the dogfish and any other uh, of these elephant ranks can do that too, but um, they're not so good in using lipids. So in, in their heart and muscle tissue, they actually uh, have very li limited or uh, no uh, fatty acid oxidation at all. So they have to use something else and they actually rely very much on ketone bodies. A little bit like our brain only uses glucose and uh, ketones as well, especially when you're starving. Uh, and also amino acids are used as an oxidative fuel in those tissues. Other tissues do uh, use fatty acid, acid uh, oxidation. Uh, and the one that uh, gives or, or supplies ketone bodies is the liver, which is uh, very large in shark has a large lipid storage and can produce uh, ketone bodies on demand. So something else that differs very much is ion regulation, ion regulation and osmoregulation. So for most uh, telios fish in a marine environment, it's actually quite challenging. It's a very salty environment. Their body osmolarity is lower than that of seawater. So that means that in this marine heliosphere, it loses water all the time. It shrinks basically because salty environment around it uh, uh, sucks the water out of it and it gains iron. So it continuously has to counteract and it will drink uh, seawater and then excrete the salts because now it also has to excrete the salt that come with the seawater and keep the seawater or the water of that seawater in its body. This excretion mainly happens over the gills. In fresh water, they're just the opposite. Uh, they are much more concentrated than their environment. So they act a bit like sponge, they absorb all the water and they have to pee all the time, very dilute uh, urine and take up salts because they lose salts all the time as well. But these sharks, they're quite smart. They say, I don't want to do any of that. I'll just keep my osmolarity about the same as seawater so I don't have those problems. And uh, if we look at uh, how they do it, I actually have. Um, so these are our teleosts. Uh, what they do is, uh, so the seawater has an osmolarity of, of about a thousand milliosmoles. These little fishies are around 250 or 300 milliosmoles, somewhere in that range. And so they lose uh, water all the time, gain salts all the time. Um, so they have to drink. Of course, they're doing the salt too. The kidney does not play a big uh, role here actually a lot of the marine fish don't have ne like filtering nephrons they act actively secrete what they want to uh, secrete in in their urine so they don't want to lose much water and they use their gills to excrete the salt but this guy here so osmolarity 
uh, mainly sodium chloride in the seawater. Again, type of miosmols. Despite the fact that they're isoosmotic, so the same osmolarity, their salt level, sodium chloride, is also lower than in seawater. But the total is still slightly above seawater even. So they don't have to drink. And they compensate that lack between uh, the total and sodium chloride with uh, high levels of urea. These high levels for us would be lethal because you know your high levels of urea in your blood would intoxicate you. They interact with your uh, protein. Uh, so the shark also have uh, trimethyl amine oxide, which also aids into the osmolarity, but also protects their protein from these high levels uh, of urea. So because the salt is still lower than um, the seawater, they do have to excrete it. They do very little over the gills because these gills have to be very tight, of course, because there's huge concentration gradients of urea over these gills. But they have a special gland that we don't have, and it's called the rectal gland because of its position, of course, and that uh, excretes the sodium chloride. So they don't have to drink because their osmolarity is high and uh, they do excrete a lot of sodium chloride and they actually are the only animals that we know that actively reabsorb urea when they lose it. And their kidney is actually built to reabsorb ure urea, not to excrete it in their urine because nitrogen is a very expensive compound in uh, nature. So you wanna recycle it as much as possible. It seems a successful strategy, strategy because one of the teleos does have it too, and which is this guy, the silicant, also accidentally a very ancient um, uh, animal. So it seems to be uh, a strategy that pays off. Elasma brands are really, I, I fell in love with them during my postdoc with Chris Wood because I saw them swimming in the shark tank that we'll uh, get to a bit later. And they're so gracious and, and majestic, even if they're smaller uh, sharks. Um, but they also hold some records like the Greenland shark, uh, as far as we know, is the longest uh, limb uh, vertebrate. They can get up to 400 years old. So imagine where we were 400 years ago. The, the guys that swim around now were born uh, then. And uh, this also means that they have a very slow lifestyle. Uh, they get over puberty when they're about 150 years old and then they're mature and ready to reproduce. So uh, this also means that conservation wise, these are very uh, difficult species to work with because these are the time scales you have to think about if you um, go over a tipping point in um, fishing too many of these. It will take a long time before populations will be restored. Another champ is a, a whale shark, which is of course the biggest fish that we know um, and who is itself very peaceful and plankton eater. Uh, so uh, they get up to more than 10 meters uh, in, size. in size. So nevertheless, despite the fact that they are so ancient, we see now that there is a very big decline in abundance of uh, shark and the oceanic sharks have been um, decimated or at least declined with over 70% over the last 50 years. And also reef sharks has been uh, threatened. A lot of this is of course because of fishing, overfishing, either as a target species or as bycatch in many other um, uh, fisheries. So, since I'm an ecophysiologist and I look at how environmental influences um, interact with these fish or how they respond to it, uh, we also wanted to know whether water quality could actually be an um, issue. So is the degradation of their habitats and the water quality 
uh, also contributed contributing to this decline in uh, populations. And we looked at uh, effects of ammonia and eutrophication uh, at hypoxia. Now that due to eutrophication, there is more and more hypoxic and anoxic zones in the ocean. So how do they uh, respond to that? And we also looked at uh, some ecotoxicology, micro contaminants. Uh, these are long living vertebrates. They're not all Greenland shark, but even regular dogfish can get up to 50 years old um, or depending on the species, even more. So they are also have fatty livers. So that means that they could accumulate as well organic pollutants. So this certainly is a worry. And most studies you find on microcontaminants and uh, sharks are actually just to see if they are safe to eat. So they just measure concentrations in the fillets uh, of uh, the shark to see whether they are uh, safe for human consumption. And the one of most concern is mercury. Uh, mercury is a very special metal in the fact that it can be present in anorganic form, so uh, be hydrophilic and dissolved in, in, um, in the water and in your cytoplasm, but it can also be present as methyl mercury. So then it behaves as an organic pollutant. And we see that it stores a lot in, uh, in fatty tissues actually, and in uh, muscle tissue as well. Mercury is a neurotoxicant, so uh, it's not good for your development, definitely not for little kids' development, or if you're pregnant, can be uh, really dangerous. So I just finished my sabbatical officially. <laughs> uh, so I had a year uh, of sabbatical where I really wanted to focus on research, um, regarding sharks and we looked at uh, or collected some preliminary data on uh, what would be uh, possibly be a good chronic stress indicator in the shark. Um, we looked a bit at uh, older work on hypoxic zones and uh, one of the uh, things I did in my uh, postdoc with Chris Wood this was in the previous century, so it's been a while. It's still not resolved, and, and is that we found out then that they are very sensitive to one metal in, in uh, particular, and which is silver. So I'm gonna give some examples about the hypoxic zones and uh, mostly and about the silver work. So uh, this is where I live here in Belgium. And um, so this is where I did my postdoc with Chris Wood uh, in uh, McMaster University in Hamilton, close to Toronto. Um, during that postdoc, we also went to Vancouver Island, this, and that's where I first uh, worked with uh, shark. And then of course, this is Lucy Maria, because I got to go there too, sadly without Jody, but still not bad. So in Moria, we looked, we, we just took part in the Fisio Shark project and kept things going and um, started some new work as well with uh, Shamil, uh, who will start his PhD uh, on the shark as well. And on the left, you can see Shamil measuring uh, this black uh, reef shark and me sampling some mussels. Uh, some muscle tissue from a uh, baby lemon shark. But I wanted to talk most about the work I did uh, in Banfield. Uh, you can immediately see this is one of my favorite places in the world. This is what it looks like every day when you come out and you walk to the lab. This is what you see. And uh, this is the species we work with there, which is uh, the spiny dogfish. Uh, during my postdoc, I did uh, uh, two projects. One was on metabolic effects of cortisol and trout, and the other one was on the silver uh, toxicity. 
And we first started working with uh, Telios, but then also added uh, the dogfish. So I had only a half year postdoc there, but quite productive. I still look a bit younger uh, then, because in that half year, uh, we managed to put out uh, three papers. Uh, I didn't sleep much during that time. Um, so uh, we had the uh, spiny dogfish, which for a long time was called uh, Squalus acanthias. Uh, but now the Northern Pacific uh, population are reclassified because they used to be squalus sukli and they regained that uh, old name. And then when we work with them, we often uh, put little <coughs> catheters in them so we can blood sample and then we keep them in separate boxes. So one box uh, per dogfish where they have uh, well aerated. Uh, water and we can, you know, take blood samples like that on a daily basis for a few days uh, in a row. Again, it's just so nice out there. So, why is uh, the squalus suckley now uh, reinstated in its old name? Well, they find that there is not differences, of course. Uh, they grow larger and they become older. They become about 100 years old, so um, at least one third older than uh, the squalus acanthias, and they reach maturity later. Um, also, their gestation period is longer. They have uh, oviviparous uh, development and up to two years of uh, gestation period. They're mainly epibentic, they're just on the uh, seafloor, and uh, the younger ones uh, in their puberty years, they tend to go offshore, but the adults actually come back uh, close to shore, and that's how we catch them for research. We actually just angle uh, for them in the evening after our lab work. Um, we only use males in our study to reduce the impact on our on the populations, and also the females often are pregnant or most of the time are pregnant, so you don't really uh, want to influence that. So why look at hypoxia and hypoxia tolerance? Well, there's not much known about. Uh, the physiology of these sharks in uh, general, and uh, also not so much about hypoxia and anoxia tolerance. Here you work with a very anoxia tolerant species, the epaulette shark, uh, but not all sharks are so uh, anoxia tolerant. So uh, what you see here is the hypoxic zones, uh, either in the uh, open ocean or in the coastal zones, you see there's quite a few uh, red dots here. And if you look at where we can find the spiny dogfish, you can see that it overlaps for a large part here and here with these uh, red dots that you see there. So they definitely, and certainly because they live um, like on the continental plate, they would definitely be subjected to hypoxic uh, situation. Also for squalus acanthias, actually you can see that there is a large overlap, especially in the northern Atlantic with hypoxic uh, zones. So what we did first is look at aerobic metabolism, respiration rates. So um, to do that, you just seal them off in one of these boxes and you follow oxygen consumption by measuring oxygen in the water for a certain period of time. And what we did then is to look at their um, anoxia or hypoxia tolerance is follow them as the oxygen levels in the water uh, drops. There's two ways of doing that. Very often people just, you know, seal off the box and wait till they use up their oxygen. So then you get a slowly reducing oxygen level it does have the problem that you also accumulate waste products and one of the most uh, common in that case is carbon dioxide, of course, because they 
uh, are breathing, uh, and that affects the pH. And also, the uh, carbon dioxide is a strong re regulator of your uh, breathing pattern. Uh, so that has uh, uh, certainly also an influence then on the hypoxia tolerance. Or you can do an open system, as we did here, where you bubble with nitrogen to lower uh, the oxygen content. And then you don't have this accumulation of carbon dioxide because it just gets bubbled away. And what you see here is that if the water level, oxygen level drops, you see that uh, the oxygen consumption rates also uh, slowly uh, reduce. Most fish have a critical oxygen concentration. They are able to keep their breathing rate and uh, oxygen consumption stable up to a certain point where the oxygen in the water is really too low, and then suddenly they cannot regulate anymore and their oxygen consumption really drops. They cannot breathe hard enough anymore to keep up their normal respiration rate. Here you see a bit kind of in between. Um, it does already go down in this first part at the higher oxygen levels in the water but much less than you would expect if they did not regulate at all. But then there seems to be like a critical oxygen point around here, 10% saturation, where the oxygen consumption really uh, drops. So that's what you see here. Um, nevertheless, if we look at individual fish, we do see that there is a big difference between individuals. Like the red one really seems to have a nice critical oxygen concentration uh, right here. And it manages quite nicely to pop and then suddenly whoops. Uh, while the blue one seems to be more an oxyconformer. So it just follows the oxygen level in the water and does not seem to try to regulate its breathing very much. It just says like, okay, I'll go with the flow Whatever is available, I'll use, and uh, I will not put much energy in, in hyperventilating, for example. This is also seen in uh, uh, embryos of dogfish that, uh, depending on the temperature that they're at, they can either be oxygen regulators and keep a nice, steady uh, oxygen consumption, or oxyconformers and just let their breathing rate decline with um, uh, the environmental oxygen. So it seems that even as adults, they still have the option to choose either one strategy. So this is uh, what we did, or what we did to examine this a bit more in detail is we can allay the doctor so he is on a surgery table, uh, he has water uh, with a sedative going over his gills and his mouth. And we cannulated them. We put a catheter in the dorsal aorta, which is just below uh, the tail. And uh, we put a little uh, catheter uh, in the septum between uh, the gills. So when it moves, it actually transfers the water pressure to a pressure transducer. And we can measure uh, breathing rates. Here you still see an old fashioned way with a paper and a pen. Now this would be a laptop. I'm still not sure if that's an improvement or not. It certainly makes the data analysis a lot uh, easier. And then the dogfish would be in pair, dark in the box, just sits there, gets water and uh, air. And these little boxes are to keep our uh, electrodes at the right temperature. So this is what you get for a nice uh, breathing uh, pattern. And there are two things we uh, measure is the frequency, how many breaths per minute uh, do they take and the amplitude, like how deep are the breaths? So how wide are these uh, breathing um, movements? So um, this is uh, what the, uh, the, the traces should look like, but sometimes they look a bit different. And especially we always joked when, this is Chris Wood, who, who I did my postdoc with, when he came into the room, uh, we called him the shark killer. He, you could get traces like this. 
which, you know, the least they move a little bit, you would get this messy signal. If they kind of put a, they lie quite still in the boxes, but as soon as they move a bit, you would get this huge uh, pressure difference. So what do we get out of these data? Here you see that the frequency, so the number of breaths, actually seems to uh, help in the regulation of the oxygen consumption, because as the, the saturation level in the water drops, you see an increase in frequency, so they're breathing more regularly, hyperventilating a bit to compensate for the lower oxygen concentration in the water. They just move more water over their gills to get the same amount of oxygen. And then it drops. Uh, so they stop doing that, although at a quite little bit higher uh, percent saturation as where their peak grip is. So they first stop hyperventilating and only a bit later that actually the oxygen consumption uh, rate drops. For amplitude, did they take deeper breaths? Statistically, yes, but I'm not very convinced, I must say, with this uh, relationship. It depends a bit on the studies. Some studies find also deeper breaths, some don't. And this can be a difference. Is it open or closed respirometry? Is the CO2 building up or not? Uh, that can make a big difference. So if we look at the blood value, so here you see the uh, oxygen pressure in their arterial uh, blood. You see that it actually decreases quite linearly with uh, the water oxygen concentration level. So here we don't see this peak rate. Again, indicated that they might be partly conforming to the external. There's a little bit uh, increase in PCO2 um, and a little drop in pH with uh, at a very low oxygen concentration. Yet again, if you look here at these data, you see that some are doing really much better. So these might be the ones that actually have a peak risk and these that already drop to very low arterial oxygen levels uh, at 30% saturation might be the ones that just also, that just uh, conform, uh, so are the oxyconformers. So individual differences again. The acidosis could be because of the carbon dioxide increase, but of course also because of anaerobic metabolism and we do see the classic response of uh, lactate uh, accumulation in their blood. However, we mentioned they have a very different type of metabolism and these ketones are really important. So we wanted to look at other metabolites as well, but you don't really know what you're looking for. So a good thing is to have uh, methods that can really screen all different types of metabolites without in advance uh, saying, I'm going to look at this or that, because you just don't know what is going uh, to happen. So we use some NMR spectroscopy. You all know NMR machines from uh, scans, you know, where you get a picture. This is hydrogen uh, NMR as well. Uh, but here they use it to look at the peaks of different substances, and uh, you can uh, compare these with databases and see which uh, metabolites you can find. So, how well do they tolerate hypoxia? These dogfish were kept for um, up to six hours in um, about 10% saturation, so exactly where the, the critical oxygen point was believed to be. And then we gave them some six hours recovery time as well and sample again. The good news is we saw nothing at all in the brain. So there was no change in metabolites at all. So for us, if you are short of oxygen, if you get anoxia because someone is strangling you or because you get a heart attack or a stroke, 
uh, the brain has about two to three minutes before you get irreversible uh, damage. Here, six hours, no change at all. In the liver, we see the classical response increase lactate and not, a, not much more. Um, and this recovers completely in this six hour recovery period. Also in muscle, we see uh, increased lactate uh, with recovery. So, um, so far, this seems a pretty normal uh, response. And in gills, we see increased lactate and reduced glucose. Again, what you would expect if the glucose is used up in uh, the anaerobic metabolism. Here, we did not see recovery in six hours. So the gills seem to be very dependent on uh, aerobic metabolism. So this does not seem too bad at all. But then we looked at the other metabolites and you know, this ketone metabolism, it was very important in muscle and heart. And we do see uh, several um, ketones that uh, are M fatty acids like acetoacetate that are decreased and do not show any recovery at all in a six hour recovery period. Also amino acids, lots of those were uh, decreased and then some other as well. Uh, one of them was uh, the trimethyl aminoxida. This was the one that prevented the damaging effects of the urea. So it seems to indicate that something is going on with uh, osmoregulation as well. <clears throat> and uh, some molecules that are involved in uh, uh, defenses against oxidative stress. Again, in Gill, we saw lots of differences as well, like also indicating osmoregulation and membrane function was uh, compromised. So it confirms the importance of ketone bodies uh, and they do not recover well or they need more time to recover. And we do see several indications of osmoregulatory compromise and what this means, osmoregulatory compromise, is that if oxygen gets low, you hyperventilate, you breathe harder, you pump more water over the gills, but that also means that you have more possible losses of ions, uh, urea, whatever. So you have to compromise between do I want to breathe or do I want to keep my ions uh, stable? And then some oxidative stress. But to me, it mainly indicates that uh, all these long lasting effects would be missed if you only look at glucose and lactate. So it's really important to always have the right biomarker for the species that you study uh, to follow up the processes that they are involved in. Okay, then we worked on uh, silver toxicology try to keep that short. Um, and again, one of the pictures there, there's sea lions and sea eels and whatever. You guys live here at the ocean, but I live in Belgium, which is a small, very densely populated country. So I get really excited if I see things like this. Uh, so these studies on silver were done during my postdoc in 97, and then some further work was done a few years later. A lot changed in these years. These, these two were there as well in 2005. So this is again Chris Wood, who was my postdoc supervisor. And I just put it in still uh, to you know, encourage you to say there is a good, well, it's not an easy combination, but it's definitely possible to have kids and a career. Um, and my children actually loved it out there. Uh, my partner at the time was uh, not coming in along, but I always found someone if I said, well, I'll pay you a ticket and you get to go to the other side of the world. You just have to watch my kids. Usually one of my uh, co-players in my basketball team would say, oh, I've never been anywhere. I want to come. <laughs> and then sometimes regret it thereafter. 
I must say, I was taking away the beer. I was not kidding. <laughs> <laughs> They're now 21 and 19, so they survived pretty well. So what we looked at uh, was uh, at metal toxicity. And again, we put them in these boxes. We had the catheters for blood sampling. And we also, uh, every 12 hours, would shut off the water flow for a few hours and look at uh, excretion rates uh, of uh, ammonia and urea, uh, for example. Uh, and we started uh, in those days Photography was very, still very uh, analog based. So you had films that had to be developed. Silver was used in the process and Kodak uh, supported some research. They knew it was quite damaging in freshwater systems because it interacts with sodium transport in freshwater organisms. But again, nothing much was known uh, for marine organisms. So we started with a dose that we thought was really sensible. Because in seawater, a lot of the metals also uh, form salts. When uh, you would have, if you add silver, you would have uh, silver chloride, silver carbonate, and so on. So they're not so bioavailable anymore. They are not taken up. It's just a free ion that really uh, is taken up very quickly. And what happens, sadly, uh, is that within 72 hours, uh, oh, no, within 24 hours, sorry, all our dogfish died. This was not at all what we expected. We, we, were, we intended to do a sublethal exposure and to see at their effects. So we reduced it by more than uh, three times to 200 uh, microgram uh, per liter. And again, we lost our fish now in three days uh, time. So then we went to 30 microgram per liter. This is where you would, you know, a concentration that you would expect in fresh water to be uh, damaging. And certainly not in seawater. And even then we lost one uh, dogfish. And we did see effects with the other as well. We saw some respiratory disturbance. So their gills were damaged because of the silver. Uh, but most of all, we saw osmoregulatory uh, disturbances. A few years later, in 2005, we repeated this with copper, because copper and silver always tend to have the same effect. They uh, interact with the sodium-potassium pump, and they block it. And so your sodium transport is disturbed. Your sodium gradients are the driving force of a lot of ion transports in your cell. So we expected to see the same with copper, and here nothing much actually. You see the concentrations uh, are much higher and the survival uh, is much better. So it doesn't seem to be the sodium potassium ATPase that is the main target here in these uh, animals. So uh, the year after, although it was published the year before, I'm a bit really slow writer. Uh, they did a direct comparison between telios and uh, some elasma brines, and you see dogfish and long nosed skate, and then different kinds of uh, telios. And here you see as well, if you look at the gills, that uh, the silver really accumulates to much higher levels in the uh, elasma brines compared to the telios. We saw that too, a very high accumulation, even at a low concentration. And even if you pick a, a shark from nature, anywhere you could have measurable uh, silver levels in uh, liver. Not true in the intestine. Why? Why would you not have accumulation in the intestine? No drinking. Well, they didn't have to drink for their osmoregulation. So they don't, they, they eat, but they don't drink. And then uh, in the liver, also quite some accumulation, doesn't seem like much compared to the others, but they have this huge liver. So if you don't 
uh, user per kilogram weight, but just per total liver, it was um, uh, five to 15 times higher accumulation rate uh, there as well. So this confirms that there is something different going on between those two animals and that it's not just about uh, speciation in the seawater, about salts that uh, start to form. Uh, again, a few years later, we did with European uh, dogfish or spotted uh, dogfish. We tried this again with different metals. For all metals, we used 10 micromolar, except for silver, we took a hundred time and a thousand time dilution um, because we didn't want to get the same result again and they all died. And even then you see the accumulation rates are within the same range as these other metals that were a hundred or a thousand times more concentrated. concentrated. So this is in the gill, uh, in the liver, uh, in the plasma. Copper, of course, can be really high because it's an essential element. You need it in your enzymes and, uh, to function. And uh, a little bit in the kidney as well. So again, silver was different from all the others. So why is that? Well, we looked at urea loss. And this is what we got in when we closed off the boxes, the water flow for a few hours, uh, every 12 hours. Um, then we saw that at the highest concentration, there's really a huge loss of uh, urea, the second concentration as well, not so much at the lowest concentration where they ma mainly survived. If you did the same with copper, you did not see that much difference between uh, the different concentrations. And this is urea in their plasma. So here you see that it's not only lost to the environment, but it actually also decreases in their plasma and not so much if we do it with copper. So one important iron regulatory uh, organ for them was the rectal gland because it excretes a lot of um, uh, salts. <laughs> This is Pat Walsh, who was also there at the time, and he was doing perfusions of rectal glands. So he took out the rectal gland and provided it through a blood vessel with dogfish saline, so artificial dogfish blood, but without the red blood cells, um, and glucose, and so on. And then looked at what the rectal gland was producing. And also there we saw that. Uh, the urea secretion with silver really increased a lot and it, sh it shouldn't. They normally try to retain this urea as much as possible while the chloride excretion, for example, stays basically the same. So it was really specific for urea. So what is uh, our hypothesis now? If this is a kill cell, this is a, an older, uh, picture I couldn't find any new ones. Um, why is urea transport so affected? Well, it's hypothesized that there is a urea back transporter. So they're going to lose some urea through diffusion. And there is some transporter that is all the time working to take this up again. You see a very thick line here in this basal lateral membrane of this gill cell. This is because they have very tight membranes and a high percentage uh, of their membrane lipids is actually cholesterol. Cholesterol is not something good for you. What happens if you have high cholesterol? Yeah. Yeah, your heart right? it either can build up in your uh, arteries, but it can also make your uh, cell walls more brittle. They become harder and it's easier for that they rupture instead of being flexible. So they have high cholesterol and it makes the membranes tighter, harder, you would say, but for them, it's kind of a tightening up of the membrane. So in any cell, if you increase the cholesterol level, you would have less permeable membranes because it makes them less uh, flexible. 
And sodium potassium ATPase was not so affected because there was this difference with copper. So this urea back transporter is supposed to be linked to sodium transport as well. So it's a sodium urea antiporter, and it brings the urea back into the body when it diffuses out, and they have to get rid of sodium anyway. And you have sodium potassium ATPase to regulate this anyway. Here it's set in the basal lateral membrane. Now it's there is more consensus that it's actually in the apical membrane. Because if you would put it here, that would mean that in these cells, urea levels would already be low. And then you have this, the seawater. But actually, the urea levels in the gill cells are regular, like normal. So that means that this barrier should actually be there. But there's no good way of, uh, or no easy way of testing that. So for my sympathetical, uh, we try to tenolate gills, so we could perfuse them with dogfish saline and then add urea transporter blockers and see what effect that could have uh, on the silver transport. But, you know, shard gills are a bit annoying in that they go all around between the septum. So if you have a normal fish gill, you just take it out and you have a beginning and an ending where you put your tubes and there is no or, or little leakage here, you really have to cut through the gill tissue. We made a, a little device to hold the skin because that would leak urea as well and that would mess up with our uh, measurements, but still didn't work very well. We tried whole head preparations. Uh, these are dead heads and the brain has been fitted. Uh, but you could then perfuse and you uh, perfuse them through the heart and then your saline runs through it uh, and comes out in the gills of our time to see what happens at the gills. Or we haven't gotten to that yet, is to make little vesicles, little like uh, uh, destroy the cell basically and have apical little vesicles of membrane and by basolateral vesicles. And you can measure the difference because in the basal lateral, we know that there's a lot of sodium ATPase, sodium potassium ATPase. So if you measure that, you can see like, okay, this works. We have a high concentration of sodium potassium ATPase, so we have basal lateral vesicles. And also there, you could work with um, radioactive silver, for example, uh, and blockers for urea transport and so on. So that was it. If there is any questions, 